Hello and welcome. I'm Gustavo Tolosa, the Start Solution coach and pianist, musician, and I should actually say the other way around because most of my life, since age nine, eight, I've been a musician. And uh, so anyways, uh, I want to welcome all of you. It's always so nice to see um, everybody logging in and saying hello. It's, um, let me see, it's just, uh, oh, thank you. I love that shirt. I bought it in Fort Worth um, in, when I went to see the Nutcracker in December of last year, when the world was a different world. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I get a little nostalgic when I think about what the, our world will look like after all this is over. Hopefully it will be over. And I have a little surprise for you at the end. Today it's not music, it's a different kind of music, but I think you will like it. So I encourage you to stay until the end. I want to um, say my usual disclaimer, because even though I have a doctorate, I am not a medical doctor. I am a doctor in musical arts, in specifically in piano performance and literature. Uh, I have uh, the Starch Solution certification from the Dr. McDougall's um, Health Medical and Health Center, and it's mostly to guide all of you through the Start Solution program, but I do not give medical advice. Um, I have taken many, many courses and read many, many books and attended lectures and living programs, etc., and done hundreds and hundreds of webinars with doctors, chefs, nutritionists, psychologists, etc. Uh, I just say that because I do have a lot of knowledge I can pass on to you. Um, but most importantly, I can sh I can direct you to the to the source that you uh, the direct source uh, where this information comes from, which in this case in this book club that we're having uh, is from Dr. McDougall's masterpiece, I think, which is the Start Solution book. So the disclaimer is that anyone watching this who would like to change their uh, nutrition, their diet, uh, every time you make a change in diet, you should consult with your doctor, with your medical doctor, because in the case of Dr. McDougall's um, recommendations of nutrition, it makes such a powerful impact, good one, I should say, in our bodies, that uh, many, many times medications have to be adjusted or taken off. But that has to be done with medical supervision. So I encourage you to always be in touch with your doctor. Hopefully it is a doctor who is knowledgeable about plant-based nutrition. But if not, it may take you a little work to do some research and find one. Uh, and if you need any help with that, I think there is help at Dr. McDougall's website, which is drmcdougall.com, or I might be able to direct you to uh, some information. So I see that, um, yeah, I got a new haircut. Thank you for noticing. Um, so, Yes, thank you. And, uh, oh, from Sweden, thank you. You all are so kind, and I love this time together. I remember from our first time how we all, how I said that we just need to be kind and respectful to each other. We are all in a different uh, time in our journey through this um, way of eating which is not, it's easy to do because it really is, but it's difficult because the world around us is not made to support that. Uh, the world is not 
our, our families and friends most of the times are not um, um, willing to accept or to even listen to what we have to say. So in that respect, it takes effort and it takes time and it may be difficult and discouraging at times. So I encourage you to be part of a group, like you can be part of my Facebook Start Solution book, uh, sorry, my Facebook page, which is called Star, uh, Dr. Starch. Dr. Starch, all spelled out, that's my Facebook page. Or you may find another McDougall group where you can uh, be a member of, or you can just come to this weekly transmission broadcast and then keep in touch with email. I don't mind that you email me other than sometimes it takes me a little longer to, to answer. So um, I just wanted to point out one thing from all of these chapters that we've been reading so much so far. To me, one of the most um, important points is when Dr. McDougall talks about what is a starch? What is starch? How is it made for those of us that like to know a little bit more of, of science and why starch is what will uh, help us regain our health and our vitality and our energy and even our uh, younger looking selves because starch is pure energy, is pure energy, is what the body burns first and it is pure because we consume pure starch. We don't um, eat it with uh, hormones and with uh, processed oils and with cholesterol and with other animal derived products. We eat the starch that is pure. And basically, besides other chemicals, were, well, not chemicals, elements that Dr. McDougall talks about, the starch that we consume is full of fiber and water and we need to remember this it's like an equation fiber plus water equals satiation we feel satiated we feel full we don't feel hungry fiber and water plus the other nutrients but these starches are low in calories so it, what else? This is this is the magic food that everybody in the world wants, and we know we know this secret. Secret. We know this this is the way to um, lose weight and to be healthy because we can eat large amounts. Uh, we can eat volume so that we are, our stomachs are content and happy and the calories are low so is volume is high to keep us full and the calories are low which is the opposite of what most other diets preach you, know, you have to count calories and weigh things and, and measure them so that because the calories are too high so you have to constrict your your amount of food so I just want to say that because that is just one of the big secrets. And I say secrets not because I want to keep it a secret or you want to keep it a secret. It's a secret because the industries and other um, groups of people, I just don't want to get a lot into any kind of politics, um, you know, uh, don't, don't uh, freely give out this information. All right, so um, I had a few questions from last week that I want to answer before we jump in today. I like to, um, to make this interactive, so please type here. I'm looking, I'm reading, um, and if you have any comments or any questions, let's see. Oh, I have to show you. <laughs> um, I'm in Argentina right now, as you know, and I am stuck here well stuck is not the world i love i like it but you know i was supposed to be flying today to dallas and now everything is closed until even they're saying until september 1st so anyway 
Uh, Argentina is a very big country. I know a lot of people think of Buenos Aires when I say Argentina, as if it was, as if I only thought of New York when I said United States, you know, it's ridiculous. Um, but Argentina, you know, goes from Brazil, almost the same level as Brazil, all the way down to, you know, to the South Pole. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of miles, and then it's very big, wide as well. So there's a lot of different climates and customs and foods. And uh, anyway, um, so I'm in a, in a, a state or a province that is called Cordoba, and I'm way up in the mountains in a beautiful little town. And look at the size of this potato. It's like my whole face. Can you believe this? One, two, these is, this is like for two people. Although I think I'm gonna eat it all tonight. So this, these are gonna become baked potatoes. And I, and I made hummus, which we love hummus. You know, it's the closest thing to, to this creaminess and buttery kind of uh, consistency. And I make it very creamy. I make my own garbanzo beans. I, 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 I cook them. And then with some garlic and a little bit of lemon juice and some cumin, you know, in the processor um, and, and maybe a little bit of water uh, until you get the, the the, the consistency, you get an amazing hummus that you can put on top of this. And you can also put some um, steamed broccoli or um, anything else, a corn, a salsa, uh, you name it. Um, so you really can't get tired of these potatoes. Um, Zucchini, yes. And one of you asked me last time, and I didn't answer it, if I ever eat vegetables for breakfast. And yes, and I think that's, I think that is the the best way to go. Um, sometimes uh, it's not possible for me, although it may sound like a sort of an excuse because yes. I have vegetables available all the time, but sometimes I don't, but I should. And at one point I was eating vegetables before my oatmeal um, because the vegetables are very, 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 very low in caloric content and it will, they will fill you up with water and fiber. And so that um, when you eat your oatmeal, you're not gonna eat as much of it and you will feel full. So it's a way of cutting down calories, cleaning your palate, getting your your good veggies first thing in the morning so you already feel good. Okay, I already had a big serving of veggies and what I used to do, and sometimes I still do, is I roast. So the first thing I do when I get up, just put that thing in the oven for the veggies to roast while I'm going to take a shower and shave and whatever, you know, I look at emails. Um, and it's just a lot of different veggies uh, cut up, it, it, broccoli, cauliflower, zucchini, um, carrots. Mm, yeah, sometimes I put a few uh, chunks of um, potatoes or sweet potatoes. Oh, onions and garlic, yes. Yeah, you would say, oh my gosh, are you gonna eat onions and garlic in the morning? Well, yes, because I'm not going to an office to work. So yes, try eating veggies. I know that a lot of people uh, buy veggies already in a bag with, that come mixed and then they steam them and with some really good, um, what do you call it, um, uh, vinegars uh, or lemon juice, you know, you can eat it that way. So that's something I wanted to mention. And um, someone wrote me an email and I wanna, I do want to spend time, I'm, I, I'm sorry in a way that I'm taking time from the book, but this is important because this is something that happens often. And if it hasn't happened to you, it might, or hopefully it will not, or you will know somebody that will have this issue. 
And it says, I have followed the plant-based diet for two years now, but haven't lost weight. I have researched so many whole food plant-based diet doctors and gurus, read many books and joined many weight loss seminars since then too. Unfortunately, I have stayed the same, which is 40 pounds heavier than I should be. Um, let me just go one at a time. And this is someone from our group. So I don't want to uh, be uh, negative or to make fun of anybody. I'm just going to be as concise uh, as possible and just um, tell you from my heart so that when you watch, if you're watching it now, or if you watch, if you're watching the replay, you can see what I'm thinking. This is a question that I've heard and so 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 many times to me, and I've seen Dr. McDougal answer it and many other uh, doctors. So um, I have followed the plant-based diet for two years. Yes, but here is one point to this: what what is followed? mean that means many different things to many different people so when somebody as a as a starch solution coach when somebody says that they have followed and some people say strictly followed i i'm not saying that they are lying to me in their minds they have followed it but i want to know exactly how they have followed it because I have seen people that they have followed it and they have gone to the store and bought um, a lot of hummus, let's say, because they love hummus and they know it's allowed, but they forgot to look and see that the hummus was pretty much swimming in oil. So if you eat a lot of that hummus, and especially with starch, and it's full of oil, you are not going to lose weight or you will lose, um, depending on what other things you're eating and how much exercise you're doing, etc. You may lose some, but you're not gonna, not gonna be happy with the weight loss. Um, so you just uh, have to be, uh, I have to know more. Okay, so uh, what would you recommend uh, for getting me to start losing it, person says. Um, I do eat a lot of potatoes, but I know I'm not perfect with uh, salt, oil, and sugar-free. I do put on some salt and just a tiny dribble of melted coconut uh, miyoki's butter. Coconut butter is, has, is high, high in fat. And even though it's a drizzle, when you add it up day after day, week after week, month after month, it makes a big difference. So uh, I have a supported, loving husband who tried being 100% plant-based for one month, but didn't like it. So he's back to the sad diet. And thus, my house has meat, cheese, and processed junk foods too which are in the, his desk drawer, but not locked. I try to stay out. Notice I try to stay out of them, but know that it is another downfall at certain times. The junk food, not the meat or cheese. Okay. We are empty nesters, but enjoy hosting dinner gatherings at our new home. Okay. And so I can imagine that the food prepare um, it's not 100% compliant because you know that some of the people that are coming uh, are, are you, you're going to prepare some of the, uh, L, the, the items that they like from the sad diet. And then it says that um, I do um, and do enjoy eating out. And I do try to make the healthiest plant-based choices there, but uh, uh, know that most restaurants are not going to be SOS free. So there are a lot of um, pro issues here. Um, problem to me is, is like more 
uh, um, permanent kind of uh, thing. These are things that can, in a way, easily be fixed. Uh, I The bad news is that r restaurants are just not going to help us. Um, I know that a lot of uh, doctors and chefs that I know don't don't put don't set a food in a restaurant. Uh, they just they just hide the oil and the sugar and salt and and other fats uh, in ways that are very difficult sometimes to to detect. So and even if they did, and you go with somebody else and you're smelling all those aromas that we still love uh, because we you know the food smells good um, and you see the other person eating this uh, food that you used to eat and it looks good and smells good and there you are eating a salad or maybe if you're lucky a baked potato with steamed broccoli which at home is just delicious and wonderful because it's simple and it's just you you taste all the different flavors but now all that is mixed up with all the other aromas and and and, and visuals so eating out is mostly a torture for a lot of people <laughs> including me and um i try i try to keep it to the absolute minimum. And, uh, and I research or sometimes even call ahead of time. Or nowadays, it's easy to look at the menu of the restaurant before you go and you can see if there's something that you can eat or combine. Um, so what I would have to do with somebody who asks me for help like this is ask this person to keep a strict food diary for one month. It is, yes, it's not uh, very uh, fun <laughs> to do uh, because you have to write down everything. Like if you eat one peanut, one peanut, you have to write it down. Um, if you eat half a cracker, you know, I don't know, whatever, everything that you eat at every hour of the day, every day for 30 days, you need to write it down and I need to look at it. I, I can 98% sure I can tell you that I will find where the issue is. Uh, when you go to the 10 day program where you're locked in, <laughs> at the McDougal Center, or when you go to True North, both of these places in Santa Rosa, California, everybody loses weight. So is there some kind of uh, mysterious energy or coordinates in Santa Rosa, California, that it makes people lose weight? No, 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 no. What happens is that everything that you eat is compliant. And remember what Chef AJ says, which is a brilliant, brilliant sentence, is if it is in your house, it is in your mouth, okay? If it's in your house, it's in your mouth. I have experienced it, and I know it's 100% true. If it is in your house, it may not be next hour or the next, you know, few hours, but eventually it will end up in your mouth. You do have to be someone with, with, with extremely strong to, to not end up with that non-compliant food in your mouth. So um, cleaning the environment, I think it's the most important thing. When I came back from the 10-day program, the first time, because then I attended uh, other times, um, I came and I basically went like this, clean my kitchen, the cupboards, the, 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 um, everything. Uh, 
it was just a total cleaning of the of of, of the kitchen so uh, the environment predicts i think almost 100 percent if you will be successful or not okay i hope i haven't been too long or too boring um and uh are you close to bariloche no i am not i am well i mean not that far but it's not um Bariloche is like the Switzerland of South America is stunningly beautiful and where a lot of um, well-to-do people go to ski. Uh, the town I'm in, in Cordoba, is up in the mountains and it's also kind of an upscale resort town where um, a lot of um, people come to vacation and it's um, a lot of German-influenced culture and food and and architecture is beautiful. And I have a bed and breakfast here, which of course now is closed, but was doing very well. And I hope that someday you can visit me because when I am in Argentina, I, 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 I'm doing the bed and breakfast and I will, you will be able to enjoy these gorgeous mountains and a lot of fun activities. And I will even cook for you every single meal or you can come and watch me cook. And so you'll have a mini uh, or a semi a 10 day or seven day living program with Gustavo. Okay, so today let's move on to our book and we're going to, let's see, I'm going to share the screen here like I usually do. And here we go. All right. You just, I just love technology when it works. Okay, oops, that's in, excuse me, I need to, Go here and here. Okay, so chapter five today, I will go through it pretty fast because um, I just, I just, I think this is a very important chapter and I think you need to read it in detail. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this at the, at our first meeting, but there are two topics that I really dislike talking about or discussing, and those are politics and religion. Uh, not because I'm not religious or because I don't have any convictions in politics, but I just uh, I just don't like to talk about that in public or even with family and friends. Okay, so here are we have some politics because Dr. McDougall has to show you that um, the system is... Um, well, using his words, it's uh, corrupt. So uh, here you have the USDA proposal for school lunches. This is what our uh, vulnerable uh, kids are eating or, or, or were supposed to be eating. And uh, half of that plate is meat and dairy. 1% is starch, 39% vegetables, and I might add that um, vegetables under the USDA, uh, the pizza is considered a vegetable. I am not joking about this. Pizza is considered a vegetable because it has tomato sauce on it. And then 10% 10 is fruit. Okay, so, the in the 1970s the usda took control of food assistance programs to become the nation's leading authority on dietary recommendations beginning in 1980 and every five years since the usda and the u.s department of health and human services have jointly published dietary guidelines that drive much of the nation's nutrition and health policy, funding and activities. Um, I did a webinar that is in my um, YouTube page with Dr. McDougall when the last 
uh, guidelines came out and it wasn't what Dr. McDougall was expecting. So it was a very interesting webinar. I encourage you to go to my YouTube channel and watch it. Uh, the USDA proposal for dietary guidelines for Americans, um, look at what it is or was 50% meat, uh, you know, kind of the same as the school lunches. Now, in July of 2010, uh, Dr. McDougall says, I responded to the USDA's call for written comments on its dietary guidelines for Americans, suggesting that it took, uh, that it look at starch's long and positive history of contributing to good health and evaluate its biased views of the scientific literature and factual errors that favor the livestock industry. So, um, Dr. McDougall sits on the advisory board of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which is called the PCRM. If you're not familiar with the PCRM, I encourage you to go to their website. There are so, so, so many free resources, and it is an organization that really is making a difference because they're constantly out there in Washington, D.C., um, trying to, to change things with lawsuits against the USDA and HHS um, over the guidelines. Okay, so PCRM, please look at that. Um, Catherine Lawrence, in her website, uh, has a lot of classes and cooking demos. Her website is foodsavedme.com, and she is a PCRM uh, cooking instructor and has mm, done so, so much work. The tide is turning. It's not as fast as we want it, but it's turning. Um, chapter six is this Dr. McDougall talking about uh, environment. And I don't know if you know this, but this, this, this is the topic that um, it's, uh, interests Dr. McDougall uh, nowadays more than anything else. He is focusing on the environment and how that's being impacted. He has several grandchildren and he is very, very upset about what we're doing to the planet and and the kind of world where his grandchildren will live in. So, um, you know, a lot of things. There are um, health crises all over the world, and we don't have to even uh, doubt that at this point. And uh, the environmental devastation, The uh, there is a chart here, which is very, very important. All of this is uh, you, it's available to the general pub public. Um, the livestock, look at the amount of global emissions by sector. Just crazy. The effects of livestock production on the environment. This is for you to read. Uh, it's very disturbing. And I want to uh, move on to our chapter of the day, which is when friends ask you, where do you get your protein? All right, plant-based yogurt. Yes, uh, if you have an instant pot, you can make yogurt that is plant-based. I never liked yogurt, so I never made it. I don't make it. Uh, but if I liked yogurt, I would make it in the in the instant pot. Actually, has a button that says yogurt, or I don't know. You know, I guess you do not have to have an instant pot. Uh, but I believe that if you're using a plant-derived uh, milk, why not? Okay. Um, so, 
<laughs> something funny. Really, it's 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 just funny to to observe. You're in a group of people. The conversation is going nice. Somehow, uh, you mentioned that you have changed your way of eating and that you are a plant based. You might say vegan. You might say be, uh, vegetarian. And all of a sudden, everybody in the room has become an expert in nutrition. And they know that you're not getting enough um, protein. And they know all the sources. Everybody is a nutritionist, a dietitian. I think it's so funny because um, nobody... Uh, talks about it until you say that you're not eating meat. So this is brilliant. It's brilliant, the work that the uh, industry, the meat and dairy in industry has, has conducted uh, to be able to ingrain in our heads that uh, protein equals meat and dairy protein equals meat and dairy plants don't have protein and if they do it's not as good as the one that comes from animals it's quite uh, amazing that they have been able to do that uh, in a, all over the world with everyone so um Let's look at this chapter because this chapter has so much good information that we will divide it and we'll do part of it today and part of it next week. So where do you get your protein? Hmm. Let me see if I turned off my camera here. Okay. Um, and you have two choices or three. You can start explaining to them where, which I really don't advise, um, unless you enjoy arguing and you might make an enemy or two. Um, I, I, in the email that will go out later, I will put a link to the um, lecture that Dr. Lyle does about this, because it is brilliant. Dr. Lyle, Doug Lyle is the psychologist in residence for the McDougal program and also for True North. Um, okay, so how much, the question here is that you that you need to know just for yourself is how much protein do you do we really need? So if someone asks you and you really wanted to get into a discussion, it, where do you get your protein? You could come back to it and says, well, let me ask you, how much protein do you think we need? Um, and so <laughs> that may be the cause of a, of a war right there because you are, the person might not know, they will feel uncomfortable and threatened. Maybe it will be someone who thinks that they know because they have read uh, the wrong information that we will see here. So, but you could say that these fundamental questions you know, how much protein we really need and what type uh, are at the core of endless debates about the best way to achieve enduring weight loss and optimal health. So the questions here are how much and what type of protein. So should you choose a diet rich in animal proteins or one based on vegetable sources? Dr. McDougall says, a diet with adequate but not excessive protein derived from plants is best, but why let popular opinion stand in the way of facts? Pushing evidence aside, the meat and cheese craving public continues to invest great faith in the mythical benefit of a high protein diet. Cadres of popular diet authors who promote that view continue to propagate the fallacy. So uh, 
many people think that these animal food tastes good, although they would not like meat so much if they wasn't served or cooked with salt, sugar, spices in the forms of steak, barbecue, and ketchup sauces, which are used to disguise meat's bland taste, what were they taken away? All right, so animal foods are big business and proponents employ the same industry and advertising supported practices that have persuaded countless people to take up smoking against their best interest and then made it nearly impossible for them to quit. How can the fact expect um, to win against these odds? I mean, everybody knows that smoking is, is not healthy. Uh, in some countries, like in Argentina, the packages come with horrifying, I can't even look at them, pictures in the front and in the back of the package of peoples and lips and faces and, and lungs and skin that looks atrocious. And, and people still buy it in, in, in by the thousands, okay? So um, how does that happen? Popular opinion ignores science. So protein intake, both the total amount and the source, varies widely around the world. People living in many rural Asian societies consume 40 to 60 grams of protein a day, mostly, yes, mostly from rice, other starches, and vegetables. In many of these places, um, they serve tiny amounts of meat, as if it was for uh, condiment, but uh, most of the, uh, you know, the, the protein and most of the calories come from plant sources. On the Western side of the globe, food choices typically are centered around meat and dairy with these foods providing 100 to 160 grams of daily protein, which is two to four times that consumed by rural Asians. Dieters on a high protein diet of meat and dairy, such as the Atkin diet, Atkins diet, could be consuming 200 to 400 grams of protein a day similar to what Eskimos survived on with a diet that was of necessity focused on marine animals. Okay, this is another topic that we can talk later, um, which is the Eskimos diet is really is not a healthy diet, okay? Um, so one of the earliest proponents of a high protein diet was the distinguished German physiologist Dr. Carl Voigt, who lived from 1831 until 1908. And then here you have the references, which you can look up. If you have the digital version like I do, you can click on these numbers and go directly to see the articles. Um, in his studies, there were no experiments. No experiments were performed and no comparisons uh, comparison was made with the significant numbers of less wealthy Europeans uh, and Americans leading healthy lives on low protein diets based largely on plant foods. So likewise, the healthy active lives of hundreds of millions of less affluent people laboring in Asia, Africa and Central and South America, whose diets provided less than half the amount of protein recommended by Dr. Voigt, were entirely overlooked when the suggested protein levels were established. Now, look at this. This is kind of scary that our current protein uh, numbers come from, uh, you know, the 1800s. <laughs> Okay, well, 
Most exasperating is that virtually all scientific research over the past century comes to a different conclusion from Dr. Voigt. Yet, elevated protein standards based on centuries-old biases continue to drive health recommendations even today. So, Voigt's narrow-minded thinking in the late 1800s, echoed and amplified by his peers, should have been put to rest by 1904. Why 1904? Well, because that's when Russell Henry Chittenden, who was a professor of physiological chemistry at Yale University, published his scientific findings on human protein needs in his classic book, Physiological Economy in Nutrition. And Professor Chittenden believed that Dr. Voigt had actually mixed up cause and effect. All right. So I will let you read that. And but um, Professor Chittenden uh, suggested that consuming protein both beyond the requirement could cause harm, especially to the liver and the kidneys. This is very important that we remember. So he was actually the subject of his first experiment to establish a minimum protein requirement. And for nine months, he consumed one third of the protein level recommended by Dr. Voigt, during which time his weight dropped about 10% from 143 to 128 pounds. And his health remained excellent and he described his condition as having greater freedom from fatigue and muscular soreness than in previous years of a fuller diet. He described how his previous knee arthritis disappeared along with his periodically sick headaches and bilious attacks of abdominal pain. He maintained his normal mental and physical activity all on about 40 grams of protein a day. The first trial involved a group of five men connected uh, with Yale University, and they received an average of 62 grams of protein daily for six months, and they, were, they remained healthy and in positive balance and uh, just fine. The second trial studied 13 male volunteers from the hospital corps of the U.S. Army. And uh, they also they received an average of 61 grams of protein daily, and they remained in good health. And the final trial involved eight Yale student athletes, some of them with exceptional performance records. They ate an average of 64 grams of protein daily and actually their athletic performance improved by a striking 35%. So the experts today agree that 40 to 60 grams is plenty. And look at this scary chart here, because I say scary because when you look at uh, Atkins type, because Atkins is not the only high protein diet out there. Now a lot of doctors and dietitians have figured out that that topic sells a lot of books. So there are many out there. And some of these people are getting 400 grams a day when in a McDougal diet, the highest is 80. And uh, even in the USDA, World Health Organization, they're saying between 33 to 71. Um, so having um, extra protein in our bodies can damage our internal organs, as Dr. McDougall is explaining here. This is, uh, I will put a pause here and um, let's see. Go back, back. Okay, any, any doubts or any questions?
that you might have. When I go get a salad, I have a favorite place in Dallas, uh, one of the few places where I go to because you can, they can make you the salad in front of you and you choose, you know, lettuce, tomato, cucumber, onions, whatever. And they make this huge salad for you. At the end of the line, uh, the employees are trained to ask you, what protein would you like with this? <laughs> uh, or would you like any protein with your salad? In restaurants, when I've ordered salads, that's the question that I get. What protein would you like with this salad? And of course, my first instinct is to say, oh, I have all the protein I need here. Protein and then start preaching, you know, but I don't. So I just kindly say, I'm fine with this or it's okay. I don't say I don't want any because I don't want to say that I don't want any protein because I have a lot of protein in that salad. All right. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions about protein. This is a very, uh, so far, just very clear chapter between 40 and 60. McDougal sometimes uh, can go up to 80, but that depends on how much you're eating, how many times, what things you're eating. But it's not in the 200s. It's not in the 400s. And um, so the main the main uh, point here that to learn today if uh, for you and then if you want to discuss with somebody is do you think that there is an unlimited amount of protein that our bodies can take without damaging it? You, we know that starch, if we get any extra, it is, it is burned as heat, as if um, it is burned as energy. If it is not burned, it is stored in an invisible way under muscles up to two pounds uh, as glycogen. And, um, but that's not the same with protein. Our kidneys and liver, they have to, they, they're trying to get rid of it. And um, it can cause damage if that damage continues to happen on a daily basis, two or three times a day. All right, so um, again, I apologize without the visuals. It was it really, there weren't many visuals. It was just the, obviously the, 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 the book, the letters. The only chart that I showed you was that one that you finally were able to see. When I'm going through the book, I can't see your comments, so I couldn't see that you were saying that you couldn't see me. All right, China study is excellent. Uh, also for excess protein. And uh, Dr. Campbell talks about this, how in the experiments that now are very well known, um, he can turn on and off cancer, like with a switch, like really on and off, on and off, uh, according to how much protein, uh, this is protein that is de derived from, uh, from dairy, uh, he was given the, uh, the the rats, the animals. So let's be very careful with protein. Even beans and some kinds of plant foods have um, quite high amounts of protein. And even though it's not contaminated with with many of the hormones and with cholesterols and other things, it's still we have to be careful. But for example, something like the potato and sweet potato it just has the perfect balance. All right, so I don't wanna go too much over an hour for our meetings. And I want to leave you today. I said I, was, I had a little surprise. I, I have been playing the piano for you. And today, instead of piano, I'd like to share with you a poem because that's one of the other things that I love besides music. And we're all going through this, these challenging times um, with the uh, coronavirus and with this world that sometimes we don't even recognize. And um, this is a poem 
by a, um, a writer from Cuba. And actually, I don't recall the name right now, but I will give it to you in, a, in the email. And the poem goes like this. Let me see. I don't want to. I want to make sure that I don't do. I don't turn off my camera here. But I want to read it because it really touches, uh, and it, it it touched my heart when I read it. It's originally in Spanish, and of course, trans, trying to translate poetry from one language to another is really a, a, a is uh, almost impossible a lot of the meaning and emotion disappears. Um, but this is the best I could do, and I hope that you will enjoy my translation from the Spanish to the English. When the storm passes and the roads are tamed, we will be survivors of a collective shipwreck. With a weeping heart, and faith blessed, we will feel happy just for feeling, just for being alive. And we will give a hug to the first stranger that crosses our path. And we will feel lucky just for still having a friend. And then we will remember all that we lost. And at once, we will learn everything we did not learn. We will no longer be envious because everyone will have suffered alike. We will no longer be lazy. We will be more compassionate. What belongs to all will be worth more than what we have individually achieved. We will be more generous and much more committed we will understand how fragile it is to just be alive. We will sweat empathy for who is still among us and for whom is gone. We will miss the old man who asked for a dime at the market. You didn't know his name and was always by your side and maybe the poor old man was your God in disguise. You never asked his name because you were in a hurry. And everything will be a miracle and everything will be a legacy and life will be respected and the life we have, and life will be respected, the life we have earned. When the storm passes, I ask God in sorrow that you return us better as you dreamed of, of us being. And with that, my dear friends, I leave you until next week. I hope you have a wonderful week. Please feel free to email me if you ever have a question about meals or food or a movie to watch like Cowspiracy or What the Health or something like that. I hope to see you here next week and uh, expect an email with a replay and some information uh, later on tonight. Goodbye, everyone.